Well, we're here today with, um, with Kevin Wheel. Uh, Kevin, as many of you know, is um, the co-founder of Libra and the VP of product of Calibra, which is Facebook's wallet for Libra. So it's exciting catching up with you today. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Kevin has his um, start, got his start in physics at Slack, right? At uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. And, um, and then, of course, you went to Twitter and then Instagram and now Facebook Calibra. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, and uh, I guess maybe I'll start at Instagram. Uh, I was absolutely loving my time there. You know, it was, it was the best job I've ever had. I was, get, I was fortunate to get to learn from Kevin Systrom, uh, who I still think is the single best pure product thinker in the world. Um, and loving the, the people, the product was doing well, the business was doing well. And then I started hearing whispers about this Libra thing. And uh, a, a woman that a bunch of you know probably named Morgan Beller, uh, who had joined from Andreessen, she was working on Andreessen's crypto fund. Um, she joined, we were friends, so I, we had lunch and caught up and I was like, oh hey, what are you working on? And she said, well, you know, nominally I'm working on Corp Dev, but really, really, Facebook needs to do this thing. And I was like, oh my God, that's the most ambitious idea I've ever heard of. And, uh, and then you know, I, I, it goes on, and I hear David Marcus is thinking similar things. And I just found myself waking up every morning thinking about the opportunities with Libra and Calibra and uh, took that as a sign. And so I jumped. And you know, I, I've been really fortunate over my career to get to work at places like Twitter and Instagram that have made an impact on the world at scale. But I think if we're successful with Libra and with Calibra, it'll probably be the most impactful and meaningful work that I will ever do. Um, what year was that that you came over? Uh, it was 18 months ago, right, right as we were getting wow, it started. Oh, what an amazing 18 months you've had. So Mark has testified before Congress several times since then. <laughs> um, the Libra Association was just ratified. Mm -hmm. uh, you now have 21 members on board. Uh, tell us a little bit, how are things going with Calibra? Yeah, I mean, it feels great. Like, I'm personally, uh, I, I like to read a lot of history because I think it puts the situations that we're all experiencing in context. And one of the things you realize is that what we've, the transitions that we're in the middle of today have echoes of transitions that the world has gone through in the past. So you go back to like radio and TV when they were first coming out, cars, even bicycles, believe it or not, got a huge amount of pushback from the, the powers that be as they were being introduced. So to me, it's no surprise that you know, we as, as a blockchain industry in general and Libra and Calibra specifically are getting a lot of pushback. And look, it's really important that we do this in the right way, that we uh, are compliant in, uh, in, in the important ways, that, uh, that we do introduce Libra and Calibra as open ecosystems with low barriers to entry that create good competition. And I think it's going to continue to be two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, but when I compare where we are now to where we were 18 months ago, it was an idea 18 months ago. And now we're having regular and positive dialogue with regulators and central banks across the world. You have 21 members of the Libra Association that's fully formed. Um, I'm, I'm super excited about how it's going so far. In the roadmap to 2020, um, did you factor in uh, meeting with the regulators along the way? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we knew that it was, this is, a, this is an important project and it, it will hopefully touch a lot of people's lives and we gotta make sure we do it in the right way. Great, okay, so you know, everybody, this week is not just San Francisco Blockchain Week, it's actually also like Global Financial Inclusion Week. Um, there are 1.7 billion people unbanked in the world, and uh, the Libra Association is one of the solutions that you're working on to address uh, banking the unbanked. So can you tell us a little bit about um, why, why do you think blockchain can solve this problem? There are a lot of other fintech solutions that are being experimented with, why blockchain? Yeah, I think the most, the most relevant analogy is actually to the internet. 
So take yourself back 25 years. You could send text messages, but they probably cost you 25 cents, and you could only send them to somebody who was on your same carrier. You couldn't send across carriers, let alone send across the world. And you could call someone around the world, but it probably cost you three or five dollars a minute. And that situation wasn't really changing because you had a small number of players, closed market, high barriers to entry, not a lot of competition, and no real desire to change the status quo. Then the internet happens. And suddenly you have a decentralized platform where the basic cost of sending a byte from a place to another place becomes basically free. And you have low barriers to entry. Anybody can build a business. Anybody can build new products. And suddenly you have things like Skype. And the minute you have Skype, you can't charge 3 or $5 per minute for long distance anymore. And you have things like instant messaging, which mean people's expectation is that they can talk to anybody in the world instantly and for free. And fast forward to today, we can all send live 360 degree video to anybody anywhere in the world instantly and basically for free. Now, look at the current financial system. It looks a lot like the old uh, communications world used to look before the internet. You have a small number of players, you have a very closed system, high barriers to entry, it's very difficult to compete. And there's not a lot of desire to change the status quo. And as a result, it hasn't changed in about 50 years. So the question that motivates us is, can we do for money what the internet did for communication? Can you create a decentralized platform where the basic cost of sending a unit of value from one place to another is basically free? And then can you do that in a way that creates an open ecosystem interoperable, low barriers to entry, lots of competition. And if you can do that, then can all of us rebuild the financial infrastructure that exists today only on top of this new open platform? And if we can, I think the world will be a much better place for all of us and for the 1.7 billion people around the world that don't have access to a bank account. Definitely, right. So the G7 recently came out against stable coins. Um, can you explain why they feel it's a threat to national monetary policy? Yeah, I wouldn't say they came out against them, actually. I think probably the better, or the, the summary, my summary of the report would be, they said there's real opportunity with stable coins. There's real opportunity to increase access and to lower costs in the financial ecosystem. That said, there's, uh, we have to make sure that this is done in a safe and regulatory compliant way, and because the impact can be large, the bar is also high. Um, there have been separate fears of currencies like Libra, um, systems like Libra, being somehow competitive to existing fiat currencies, and that's certainly not what Libra was designed to do. Uh, Libra was designed to be a payment system that makes uh, that it is more inclusive, that increases access to the financial ecosystem, that lowers costs, I don't see a world where anyone is paying their taxes in Libra at any point. I don't think people are going to be even you know, paid salaries in Libra. That's not what it was designed to do. What I hope I see is anybody who has a phone having access to a stable store of value and anybody who has a phone being able to access the overall financial ecosystem, being able to pay anybody they want to, and any merchant who has access being able to accept or accept payments at much lower cost today. So that's what we're looking for. And uh, Libra is designed to be a complement to existing currencies, not a replacement. OK. So it's super exciting to have Kevin here, because Kevin is designing the wallet that's going to enable all of us to spend Libra. And tell us a little bit about the feature set. You know, what, how are we going to be able to put money into Libra? How are we going to be able to put money, take money out of Libra? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. So, the goal with Calibra is really two very simple things. The first is to enable anybody with a phone to store value securely and for free. The second is to allow them to send money to any person or business in the world. They're two super simple things, but when you consider that 1.7 billion people, which is one in every three adults, don't have access to a bank account, they're storing any excess money that they have in cash 
in their house. Just being able to do those two very simple things is going to be powerful for a lot of people, especially when Calibra comes inside Messenger and WhatsApp and products that people are using every day to talk to their families. So the focus for us will be on remittances, will be on uh, cross-border payments that people send uh, generally between family members. People don't know this. I certainly didn't know this when I started. It's a $700 billion market. $700 billion changes hands every year across borders between friends and family, generally for things like feeding your kids or keeping up with school tuition. The average fees to send a remittance worldwide are 7% meaning $50 billion a year in fees get assessed to the people who have the least ability to pay. And moreover, because this is between friends and family, people will probably already have conversations going in Messenger or WhatsApp with their friends. And so it, for us, it was like, why does this have to cost so much? Why does it have to take two or three days to settle? Which can be a big deal if you're thinking about feeding your kids or paying for school tuition. If, this, if you already have a conversation in WhatsApp with your family, why can't sending them money be as simple as sending them a text message? And as cheap and as immediate as sending a text message. So that's, that's where we're starting. And to your point about um, how do you get money in, how you get money out, it's, our expectation is on day one, there aren't going to be tons of ways to spend Libra once you get it. So in most cases, the transaction is going to go from local currency into Libra, across to a family member, and then back into their local currency so that they can use it for what matters to them. And so it's really important for us to make it easy for you to go from local currency into Libra and back, whether you're banked or whether you're not banked. So you can imagine adding a bank account, adding a debit card if you're a banked user. And for people who aren't banked, we want to make sure that we can, you know, for example, pop up a list of local locations that will allow you to load Libra onto your phone or give Libra and get cash back, so that it's really easy for people to go between Libra and their local currency. Yeah, that's great. I love the idea of the pop-up. That makes it, sounds like it makes it really convenient. Like a gas station or something, or a 7-Eleven? Exactly. Is that what you're thinking? Okay, exactly. Great. Convenience stores, things like that. Exactly, where people pick up their prepaid phone, um, they can, I guess, then charge up their Libra wallet. Is yep. that correct? Exactly. Okay. Very cool. Um, so. You had mentioned that when, uh, when Libra launches, there may not be many retailers. Are you, are you planning on launching Calibra at the same time as Libra? Well, it's actually an interesting point because now that the Libra Association is fully formed, Facebook is one member out of 21. We have exactly the same uh, power, voting responsibility, decision-making responsibility as the other 20 members. So we, as Facebook, as Calibra, don't determine when, Lib when Libra blockchain launches. That's actually a Libra association decision. And so from the Calibra perspective, building a wallet, it's urgency for us to make sure that, uh, that our product is ready because we don't actually get the final say as to when the blockchain launches. Now, there's a lot of work to do, and we're expecting, uh, you know, we're lining up everything to be ready later in 2020, but these are actually separable things. There are going to be other wallets that are going to launch when the blockchain launches, right? How are you going to be, how, how does somebody that has the Calibra wallet work with somebody that has a different wallet? Yeah, one of the most important aspects of this being an open ecosystem is interoperability of wallets. And it's actually not something that at least I thought about a ton before I entered this space. But when you stop and think about it, it's insane that if you choose to use Venmo, and maybe I use, I don't know, Square Cash, and someone else uses Zelle, and someone else uses PayPal, those are completely separate systems. There's no way to send between them. We have to actually coordinate in order to send money to each other today, in today's world. So Libra will be a totally open ecosystem, more like email. If I'm going to send you an email, we don't have to both agree on which email provider we're going to use. If I'm going to visit your website, we don't have to both agree on which browser I'm going to use. So as you know, we're certainly going to do our best to build uh, a great Libra wallet at Calibra. But we're not going to be the best for everybody. And frankly, I understand there are going to be people who don't want to use a Facebook wallet for this. They may not have Facebook. They may not have, well, you don't need to have a Facebook 
uh, account to use Calibra. That's, that's actually a really important thing. Um, and I can talk in a second about the, the commitments that we've made around separating people's data. So your, your financial data in Calibra stays completely separate from your social data in Facebook. It's not used for ad targeting. It's not used for any of that. But it doesn't matter. If, if we don't build a great product or if you don't want to use our product, you can still get 100% of the value out of the Libra ecosystem because you can use any wallet that you want to. And I imagine there are a bunch of people in the audience today who are already building Libra wallets. We've certainly seen some great ones from the community. The whole point is that consumers should get to use whatever wallet they want to. It should be easy for them to move value around and use whichever product serves their needs best. And the ecosystem as a whole gets stronger when that happens. So that's, that's our entire, uh, it's the entire goal with this. Yeah, Kevin, so in the time we have left, I want to address privacy, scalability, and volatility. So let's talk about privacy of the transactions. Um, are, are our individual transactions, like clothing we buy or so forth, the line item transactions going to be on-chain or off-chain? So it's up, to the, it's up to you as a consumer. So if you use a, uh, a non-custodial wallet, then it's, you know, Libra has basically the, uh, the privacy properties of like a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, so pseudonymous transactions and so on. So if you're using a non-custodial wallet on Libra, then uh, your transactions are all on-chain, you're pseudonymous, et cetera. If you're using a custodial wallet, then those transactions are generally not on-chain. Uh, unless you're sending between wallets or interacting with someone who is on chain. So Calibra will be a custodial wallet uh, in large part because we believe that having the basic ability to do things like password management and password recovery is, the, is what most people will want relative to the risk of uh, you know, losing your private key and not having access to your money. The important thing though is that anybody can choose. If you don't want that trade-off, then you can use any other wallet, and that's awesome. Um, for people that do use Calibra, though, we've committed upfront, this is very important, it's something we believe deeply in, that your financial data in Calibra stays separate from your social data that exists across Facebook and Instagram and, and so on. So your financial data is not used for ad targeting, it's not used for anything at Facebook. We're actually going through an immense amount of work behind the scenes right now to make sure that this policy is true, not just in words, but in code. And look, I understand not everyone's gonna trust that. That's okay. We're gonna have to earn that trust over years. And importantly, if you don't trust that, that's why there's a whole other, uh, like a plethora of other Libra wallets, all of which are interoperable, and the consu every consumer will choose whatever works best for them. The, the Calibra is a subsidiary of Facebook, yes. but they're being treated as separate products. Is that right? So the teams, there's going to be kind of a wall between the teams? Yeah, it's a wholly owned subsidiary, um, and that's for two reasons. One, because Calibra will be a regulated entity, and two, because it helps us enforce this data separation. Um, but we're also building Calibra into WhatsApp and Messenger, so the data is separate, but the products aren't totally separate. So ads won't be served up against my transactions? They will not. OK. Um, I just want to uh, step back a second about the cash-based customers we're talking about, the unbanked customers. When they go and charge up their Libra wallet on their prepaid phone, um, they're anonymous. Are they going to need to produce some ID to do AML KYC in countries that you're, you know, the G7 countries or the US that require? Can you explain yeah. how that's going to work for a cash? Yeah, I mean, the way, that, the way that all crypto networks work today is that the endpoints tend to be regulated entities. So whether it's an exchange or a cash-in, cash-out provider, a uh, custodial wallet, those kinds of things, they are regulated entities in the jurisdictions in which they operate, and they have to uh, abide by the local rules. So usually that means some form of AML, KYC, um, in whatever is relevant in the jurisdiction in which they're operating. But if she's going to go to the gas station and get her Libra wallet charged on her prepaid phone, there's no, nobody knows her name. Um, actually, usually there, there is some form of, of KYC that you go through. For example, if you go pick up a remittance at a remittance provider today, maybe it's a Western Union, they're going to actually make sure that you have ID verifying that you are who you say you are. Uh. 
So like when she buys the prepaid phone, she doesn't have to have ID, but when she charges up her wallet, she does? Yeah, I think prepaid phones are treated differently than okay. uh, anything financial. Okay, just wanted to understand that. Um, so with regards to scalability and volatility, we've had a problem with adoption with Bitcoin and Ethereum. How is Libra, the Libra blockchain, going to be different? Well, let me say I'm a huge Bitcoin fan. Uh, I think the goals of Bitcoin are very different than the goals of Libra. So uh, Bitcoin, I think, for many people is uh, a speculative asset. It's a, uh, it's a decorrelated long-term store of value, and it's great at those things. That is not what Libra is for. Libra is not going to be amazing at those things. Libra is going to be great as uh, a payment platform that brings uh, that is more inclusive, that brings the 1.7 billion people that don't have access to bank accounts into the financial ecosystem, that hopefully lowers costs across the board. Um, and that, meant that, that means that it has, to be, uh, it has to be high performance, and the asset that backs Libra has to be stable. It has to be something you can rely on to hold its value from one day to the next, to the next, to the next, which is why Libra is essentially a stable coin backed by a basket of stable currencies, dollars, euro, yen, pounds, things like that. Um, and it's why we've made a commitment to always ensure that that uh, basket is one to one. Can you explain to us what it is in the Move programming language that will enable the Libra blockchain to scale? Well, it's not so much about Move, although uh, Move itself is is incredibly powerful and it's been really fun to see the adoption among the developer community. There have been a couple of blockchains that have actually lifted Move straight out of the Libra open source project and, uh, and integrated it into their project, Solana being one of them. And that's awesome. It's been fantastic to see. Um, one of the things that's helping Libra is it's a permission blockchain. So we can rely on, rather than needing a proof of work consensus or uh, proof of stake, which is still earlier on and is less tested at massive scale. We can use well-tested, well-understood BFT algorithms, or at least modern variations thereof, uh, that have been around since the 70s. And that, that's one of the ways that we, uh, that we get performance. We've also been able to bring a lot of the techniques that we've learned in building a big scalable service like Facebook uh, to the blockchain. And I, I would encourage all of you, by the way, Libra is totally open source, github.com slash Libra. We welcome uh, contributions. We've actually seen a bunch of uh, developer contributions already, and it would be amazing to hear your feedback, help tell us what we got right, what we got wrong, because we can make it better before we launch in 2020. Well, fantastic. We are almost at time. Kevin, you want to share with us what's next for Calibra? Sure. We're, um, we're having a lot of very good, positive discussions with regulators, central banks around the world, and I expect that will continue. Uh, but most importantly, we are heads down building so that we're ready to launch a great product in 2020. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.